Hello again, Gator Nation. Welcome back to the In All Kinds of Weather forecast. I'm your host, Neil Schulman. You can follow me on Twitter at All Kinds of Weather, on Instagram at All Kinds of Weather blog, and on YouTube under the name In All Kinds of Weather. You can also follow our new YouTube In All Kinds of Weather forecast, as well as our podcast's Twitter at IAKOW forecast. We've got our baseball softball intern, Ethan Howick, on with us to talk about the Gators' recent stickball endeavors and plus a little bit of looking ahead to the Gators' baseball postseason outlook. Before we get to that, though, quick word about our sponsors slash partners. We are proudly partnered with the Gator Good Foundation, nonprofit organization that sends underprivileged Gator fans to the swamp. We collect donations from fans, and we use them to bring someone to his or her first ever Florida Gator football game. You believe that you or someone you know is worthy of the honor for the 2023 Gator football season? Please email us at GatorGoodFoundation at gmail.com. Second, we are proudly sponsored by Stingray Branding. These folks will put a sting into your marketing and deliver results that will wow your clients. Whether it's web design, logo design, branding, graphic design, social media management, search engine optimization, marketing strategy, or mobile app design, Stingray Branding has you covered. If you or someone you know needs professional help in any of the above, here are three great reasons why you should choose Stingray Branding. Number one is it's a veteran-owned business. You can't think of a better way to properly thank those who serve our country than by giving them business. Two, it's run by a UF alum and big-time Gator fan. And three, we can personally vouch for their work because they did our new logo and our new website. They did the Gator Good Foundation website. They do all the marketing for the Charleston Gator Club, and they've still got more Gator-related projects on the horizon. So if you're listening to this podcast and your brand or company needs any help in any of the aforementioned areas, rest assured that Stingray Branding will more than take care of you. To view their full list of services and rates, go to stingraybranding.com. And with all our ads taken care of, Ethan Howick, our baseball slash softball interns back with us today. Got a lot to talk about today, Ethan. A couple of Gator seasons have come to a close. Lacrosse has come to a disappointing end with a loss to Notre Dame in its regional. Softball has come to an end with a loss that's actually just a couple of hours old as we're recording this to the Stanford Cardinal. Gator baseball season, anything but over. They have a lot to look forward to as their regular season has come to a close, but the SEC tournament and more importantly, the NCAA tournament loom in the not too distant future. But first things first, Ethan, um, you know, it's been a few weeks. So how's everything been on your end? And have, have you been enjoying the the fruits of living in Gainesville during the, the Gator spring season? I mean, it's been very I mean, very fun, uh, especially, I mean, when there's both baseball and softball in town. I know we ba- softball wasn't able to make it to the regional this year, but it's very fun to this time of year, especially because there's more events going on every day compared to like in the fall where it's like not as many. So, but I mean, honestly, this is the best time of year to live in Gainesville because you just have so many different sport events because they play softball and baseball, play three game series usually. And um, yeah, it's just been very fun. I love this type of sport and i'm looking forward to seeing more more soon so yeah thank you how have you been doing i mean good man just came back to the country after going to the bahamas on a cruise that was nice um got to got to watch a little bit of gator baseball when i got back the series against texas a&m was kind of a head scratcher especially losing on a balk off a literal balk off a walk off balk to lose a series to texas a&m that that was that that was not too fun to to learn about, but mostly for the Gator baseball team, things have been pretty rosy. We'll talk about that in a minute, but first we'll touch on the Gator softball program. We talked about them a good bit throughout the course of the season, so we thought we may as well give them somewhat of a congruent amount of time in in eulogizing the year. So, did not get a regional host spot for the first time in I mean in in Tim Walton's time in Gainesville. Um, So that's two plus decades did not make it out of the regional round for just the third time in, in Walton's tenure. And the second time since his first season, 2006, they, they got bounced out of their own regional in the one, one game by Florida Atlantic 
2012, they have the the mess on their hands with the Fagan sisters and Cheyenne Coyle. That team got bounced out of its own regional by Gulf Coast and South Florida. But every other season that Tim Walton has coached, they have made it to the Super Regionals, which is the Sweet 16 of their sport. And that's just amazing to think about that they're always, I mean, first of all, they're always hosting. Their regular season is good enough that they're always one of those top 16 hosts. And they're always winning. They're always holding serve and winning those regionals with just a couple of rare exceptions this year. Ne- neither of those come to fruition. They're, they're sent packing on the road to Stanford. that pretty much is geographically far away from Gainesville as they could possibly be. I, I guess, I mean, I guess Seattle's technically farther or Hawaii, but it's not very plausible. I mean, there's not many places they could have gone that are geographically farther away from Gainesville. They're sent there and their season comes to an end at the hands of the Stanford Cardinal. So, I mean, Ethan, it's unfamiliar territory for us to talk about a regional loss uh, because of what, what I was just running through. But I think from having watched the course of the regular season, it's not really a huge surprise that they would not make it out of the regional. Would you w- would you agree with that? Or would you say that you thought this Florida team was going to put up more of a fight than they did? So, I mean, honestly – Against the big programs and the big time teams, we saw in the beginning of the year when the Gators went all the way to California in the beginning of the year in the Marionette Classic. Um, I'm pretty sure we got run ruled by UCLA and maybe honestly one other forgot the other school, but it was another big program. So um, we've seen all year the when we're not at home, when we're at home, we can very well beat good programs. We saw against Georgia, we won a series against Georgia. Um, we, we can show that at home, but I mean, when we're on the road, especially that far away in California, I obviously, as a fan, I ex- I don't come into a regional when we're in the postseason and think like, oh, we're going to not put up a fight. Like I, I was half expecting us to put up some fight, but I was not expecting the two games against Stanford because I feel like we were put in a pretty plausible regional regional for the teams we're playing. Like we got LMU, which is a solid team. They have one or two good pitchers, but that's a team we we took care of. But I mean, Stanford, we could have been put in a a way harder regional and uh, path. But I expected us, I honestly expected us to put up more of a fight. But I I just really hope that the next year we can see more consistency that we've seen out of Gator softball because this year it's been one of the most inconsistent seasons in a couple decades. Like you said, we've just so used to hosting a regional and. I think you tweeted last time today that it's the second time we haven't reached the super regional since 2006, right? Yeah, that's, I mean, the 2020 season is always going to be a wild card whenever you put those stats out. But I mean, that, that team looked very capable. It was 23 and four when COVID called the season off in Florida, actually just fresh off a win over a very good FSU team that year. So I'm willing to believe that team would have made the super regionals too. But, I mean, just think, like, even the disappointing seasons for Florida. In 2016, you're the number one overall seed. You get shocked by Georgia when Kaylee Pualoa hits the walk-off homer in Game 2 of the Super Regionals. Florida stunned. They're just – I mean, their heads are down. They're just absolutely shocked to to have lost to that Georgia team. That was the sweet 16 of their sport. And then five years later, it's again Georgia coming to Gainesville – and you know, there's there's no walk off because Florida literally does not score a run in either of those two games. But you're again you're the number four overall seed, and Georgia is not even seeded at all. They they wound up hosting a regional because of COVID protocols. Um, but you know they they were not a top sixteen seed that year, and they come to Gainesville and they shock us again, and we're again just trudging off the field in, in absolute shock at what just happened. Those are the bottom of the barrel. Like those are the that's rock bottom for Florida softball, except for the the one stray mess in 2012 where there were off the field issues. But in terms of just on field results, the sweet 16 of the sport is supposed to be as bad as it gets. So this is uncharted territory for Florida. And that's not to say that this year's team was terrible. I mean, making a regional final is akin to making the round of 32 in your sport. That's not a 
bad season. It's just not what we're expecting. It's just not what we're used to as fans of Gator softball. We're used to making it to the Women's College World Series in OKC and then doing damage there. And then, you know, if we get knocked out in the in the pool final, in the, I guess, the equivalent of the final four, or if we get knocked out in the championship series, then okay, that's a great season. We came up just a little bit short, disappointing, but I know, all right, fair enough, great season. This is nowhere close to it. And that's why I think a lot of people are as you're as you, I think you were touching on, they, they have questions. So we'll, we'll start with, with, with just touching on what happened against Stanford. The, the LMU games were, were great. I mean, great to see Sarah Longley come up with a seventh inning homer when Florida was down two to one in that game. And then, you know, the walk-off Pal Egan, love to see that, just coming up clutch and winning that game. And then the second game against LMU, which they got to because they lost to Stanford. The first time, Florida comes out and pretty much controls that game and wins a 10-6. But the two Stanford games, I think, illustrated exactly how far this Florida team was away from its its competition. So to you, what, what do you think really what do you think really made the difference between the Gators and the Stanford Cardinal? Um, I mean, number one, and this is the number one reason why we just didn't we got pretty much we got outscored 19 to 2 in both games. And if you add add up the runs, is the pitching. I mean, when you when you give up 19 runs in two 14 innings, actually it was less than that because we got run ruled the first game. It would and only scoring two. It's the pitching was the number one reason why, and that's been the, all year. It's been slightly inconsistent. And uh, Elizabeth Hightower, great a player that took us to Women's Calls World Series twice in her career. And really, yeah, I remember you mentioned this earlier. That's the, she's one of the reasons why we we made that deep run last year sort of un- unexpectedly and um it just it's been all the pitching has been slightly inconsistent this year um we really only use three pitchers elizabeth hightower lexi delbray riley chirilicek and they've all shown very good moments and they also have had their down moments and it really hasn't helped with um i hope that our pitching staff does improve next year um, because it necessarily hasn't really helped some of the decisions that have been made. But I do hope that they they come next year. But the, that's the biggest difference, the pitching. I mean, Stanford's pitcher yesterday in that in the huge game, I think a, the game after you win your first game in a, in a regional in baseball and softball, the second game is huge because you either get to not have to play the, ne- the rest of the day and you get to the next day, you you only have to win once. But if But the Gators lost that game. So they had to play again that day. And then the next day, today, when they played Stanford again, Florida had to win twice instead of Stanford once. So that's just a huge game. And the Gators just didn't really show anything. Um, Stanford's pitcher was very, very good. Uh, her rise ball was very good. And we just didn't show anything. And our pitcher, our pitching was not nearly as good as Stanford's. And, I mean, there were some – questionable calls that I think definitely deflate an offense um especially in that top of the third inning when uh we stole the base and then they called a, pit, a pitch that was quite off the plate for Stanford strike three end of inning when we had a runner stealing for second but I mean it's it's definitely well, that wasn't the reason why we lost any of these games but I do think those that, that does deflate confidence when when you see that kind of call but it was yeah it's just mainly the pitching and um, we did. I did expect the offense to score more than two runs in two games against Stanford. I think we all knew that. Um, so yeah, what what did you think of the two games? I mean, we'll talk about that in in a second. We we have to talk about the thing that every Gator fan who was watching that game is talking about right now, and it's unfortunate that they're talking about that. We're supposed to be talking about college softball. We're supposed to be talking about the best athletes in the game going at it. We can't talk about that because that's not what's dominating the headlines right now. It was the thing that you just kind of touched on, the officiating. So let's rip the bandaid off. Let's get it out of the way. We'll talk about the game itself in, in a little bit, but – Get it out of the way. The officiating, uh, I, I know you have some venting to do, so just vent, venting session, therapy session. Get it all on the table. So the game I was watching the most closely, uh, the game yesterday against Stanford on ESPN, of course, we're going to get in the ESPN Plus thing. But the Stanford game yesterday, the huge game, I was just seeing pitches that Stanford, the Stanford pitcher threw, she was very good, that were at least 
a whole ball off the plate, and that's being generous. A whole softball off the plate, maybe even more than that. And there were strike threes to ending innings and crucial, crucial one to zero moments of the game. And that's, I mean, we've seen that in a lot of Gator sports. We've seen us not get usually the big call that, and it never really seems to, it's just, we've noticed patterns and I'm not going to front up too much on it because I don't want to, but we have, I have seen patterns watching Gator sports over the years where in crucial moments, we are never usually the ones on top and controversial strike calls or all that. It seems to be patterns in big games. I don't know if you agree or not, but what is your thoughts on it? I mean, I'm the one with that thread going of all the times the NCAA officials have screwed Florida over, so you can probably surmise where I stand on that whole issue just from that. I mean, look, Stanford beat Florida, and it wasn't a mistake. Stanford was the better team. I think if the I think if the officiating had been fair and neutral, and I don't even want to say unbiased, if the officiating had been had been even, I think Stanford wins the game by at least a grand slam. I think they win by four plus runs. I don't think they win 11 to two in the final game. And I don't think they mercy rule us in the first game. I, I just, I, I don't know how you can call some of those pitches um, the, way, the way you call them. And it really, to me, the, the worst instance was the second game where Elizabeth Hightower was finding the strike zone. I thought pretty clearly the ball was maybe about three or four inches away from dead center over the heart of the plate and about a full six inches above the batter's knees and it was called a ball and you know high tower was throwing her hands up in frustration like dude what do you want me to do with it that that pitch is as much of a strike as you could ever ask it to be and you're calling it a ball where do you want me to put it and walton of course you know tim walton wound up getting ejected because he'd had enough of it there were there were instances where florida's middle infielders skylar wallace and reagan walsh were jumping up and down and they were you know, at one point uh, Wallace let out a, an audible yelp of, of frustration or just sheer shock. You know, when she was seeing that that the balls that were being thrown were not called strikes, the pitches that were being thrown were not called strikes. And I feel it, you know, I, I feel for them that it's already an uphill battle. Stanford is clearly the better softball team. You're already probably in over your head to be completely transparent and honest about this. You're in over your head against a better team and you're getting screwed over by the officials on top of it. So, you know, again, I'm, I'm not, I'm not making excuses that that's why Florida lost. This was a better Stanford team than Florida was, but I, I just don't understand how some of these pitches can be called the way they were. I understand that every ump is going to have his or her strike zone that that's fine. You know, everyone's going to see balls differently, but at least be consistent because some of the pitches that were being granted as, as strikes to Stanford pitchers were not being given to Florida pitchers the same way. And it's just frustrating to see that, that these kids who give their all for the sport are, are getting screwed over and they have this extra additional hill to climb on top of an already better opponent than, than they are. So that's frustrating to me, but it is what it is. Again, Florida was not going to go many farther than this regional it was very clear from just watching the free winnings of them playing each other, the Gators and the Stanford Cardinal. But it is what it is. I can have that thread going. We can all complain. It, it's just the fact of the matter is we lost the game, and it wasn't going to be a different outcome if the officiating was any more even. It's not. I don't feel that as if we're complaining about it. It's just we're calling out a systematic level of unfairness from the NCAA, and there isn't really much anything we can say except that that's not fair. And really all I say when I say anything about it is that I'm just – we're just asking for it to be a fair level of playing field for Gator athletes. It's fair some ways, but there are some ways where you just don't understand why certain things like the strike calls, the pitching motions and in other sports too. So that is one thing I wanted to add. And I'll yeah. make this very clear again. I'll say this very, very clearly. I'm not, I'm not, I am not saying that the officials won the game for Stanford. Stanford, I said this like five times. I'll say it a sixth. Stanford was the better team. They were going to beat Florida one way or another. I would just have rather Stanford beat Florida because Stanford beat Florida, not because Stanford and the officials teamed up to beat Florida. I, I, I don't appreciate it when other third parties 
that are supposed to be neutral come in and just slant the odds even more against the Gators. Because Stanford, as we've said, with two really good pitchers in Elena Vauder and Nigel Kennedy, were plenty capable of beating the Florida Gators by themselves. They did not need any help from the officials. They were going to win the game anyway, so just let them do it. Don't don't step in there and make it harder for them. Just let let the natural order of things play itself out and let the better team win and let the players decide the game. That's all I want. And I'm, I think that's all you want too, Ethan. I, I agree. I think it's something that we don't want to be talking about and we don't like talking about it, but it's something that needs to be addressed because it's been seen and we just want the the players to play the game. And that's what it should be all about. There shouldn't be as much noticeably umpiring issues even though not every umpire is like that there's plenty that do their job well but we just want to see more consistency especially when the gators are playing another team so but yeah uh enough about that there there was an actual softball game that got played in between instances of the umpires screwing florida over and in that softball game stanford clearly got the better of florida and i think in that game I, I think the best way to summarize it is is with this, the stock line that you said to me first off air and then again after we, we sat down to start recording the pod. The pitching just wasn't very good and encapsulates a lot of different issues. I, I mean, first, I'll I'll take the Florida offense aside because you led with the pitching. So, I mean, you can make an argument for both. You lose you lose two games by a combined score of 19 to 2, and it's not just one thing, which is why I kind of phrased that question that way. But to me, the, the more... Not the more, but I, I guess the the equally alarming thing is that Stanford is a team that I don't think has a lot of secrets about what they do. I mean, they they have two really good pitchers in Nigeri Kennedy and Elena Vauder. Vauder kind of scatters his own a little bit more. Nigeri Kennedy is more of their up pitcher with a rise ball that can just explode out of her hand and then wind up by your eyes. 0.49 ERA coming into the to the tournament. I'm not sure actually what it is now. The, the game just ended, so I'm, Stats haven't refreshed yet on Stanford's page, but coming into the tournament, 0.49 ERA was the best in college softball with 11.9 strikeouts per seven innings, which is also the best in the game. And, you know, we knew that like we, we have game film like anyone else does. We know that she's a great rise ball pitcher. We know that Vauder is more spread out through the zone and we couldn't touch either. We, we just couldn't touch them. There were good at bats here and there. Avery Gells put a nice barrel on one, um, in the game today she hit one right off the wall just missed a homer by probably five ten feet or so like to see that she could be a big piece of, of the gators next year sneaky you know six seven eight type of, of hitter in the lineup could be very useful for us but we couldn't string together enough you know consecutive hits like that kendra falby also with a very good regional getting a, a actually Falby being one of only two Gators to have a hit in each of the two Stanford losses, the other being Skyler Wallace. Florida just couldn't string together enough consistency in its lineup to get any real rallies going. And the couple of times they had multiple runners on base, they just couldn't do anything with them. So definitely disappointed to see that. But you talked about the pitching. I'm a huge fan of Elizabeth Hightower. She had a tremendous season in 2021. She had a nice hand in the Florida Gators going to the College World Series in 2019 and in 2022. Something just wasn't right with her this year. I'm not going to speculate as to what that was. I'm not going to speculate as to why the numbers just weren't there, but she just wasn't the same pitcher as we've seen her be in the past. In 2021, Florida is one of the top four teams in the country. She has an ERA of 1.61. Following year, 2022, she has an ERA of 2.43. And this year, her ERA balloons to 3.48. And the eye test backs it up. It wasn't a mistake. It wasn't just an instance of, oh, well, she looks the same. She looks great. It's just that batters are, are catching on to her, and they're, they're just getting lucky by dumping more balls and gaps, whereas a couple of years ago they were just harmless fly balls. No, she just wasn't hitting spots this year. She just wasn't the same pitcher. And, you know, I, I love what she's done for the Florida Gators. I love the contributions that she's made towards this Gator softball program. She just wasn't that reliable this year. An ERA of 3.48 in softball is, is just not the Gator standard. It's simply not where the Gators need 
to be with their most trusted pitcher in the circle. And I think she'll be the first to tell you that this isn't a knock on her. I think she'll tell you looking back at her career. Yeah. I, I wish I'd, I wish I'd done more um, in, in my senior year, but for her to be the Gators most trusted option in the circle with, with Riley Trilicek and, and Lexi Delbray also as options there for, for a 3.48 ERA to be the profile of the most trusted option you've got in the circle, your offense better have, nine Skylar Wallace's or nine Lauren Hager's or Amanda Lorenz's or Kelsey Stewart's to, to make up for that. And the Gators just didn't. And it's, it's unfortunate because it, it sucks watching her struggle after being so dominant for Florida just two years ago for her to be a different pitcher this year. It, it sucks to watch. I, I know she's not happy about it, but you know, we, we have a job to do and, and that's to to talk sports, the good, bad, and the ugly. And, it just wasn't it wasn't where the Florida Gators needed it to be. And that's 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 as simple and, a, and as respectful and as to the point as I think there can be about it. This year we did not we we did not have a really true ace on the staff that came through and was a pitcher you could count on every single day. In the past in the past, I mean we've had ton the Gators were known for having aces. I mean Lauren Lauren Hager, um Alicia Acasio and Elizabeth Hightower a couple years ago, Kelly Barnhill. I mean, the Gators always had that one ace you could count on in very high impact postseason games like we've had the last couple days. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that that I don't think that, that the Florida pitching staff this year was was one that particularly helped the Gators cause. And the offense definitely was was better than the pitching staff, relatively speaking, but I mean, again, like, I mean, I was kind of alluding to it when you have a 3.48 ERA from who's supposed to be the best pitcher on your staff. It's just, it's, it's hard. It's hard to win games when that's your most trusted pitcher. And look, Hightower's done some great things for the Florida Gators. She's, she's a pitcher that, I mean, her 2021 season is one of the better ones we've had uh, in, in, in recent memory, certainly since Barnhill departed in, in 2019. But that's just not, the DNA of a team that's going to have a lot of success in the postseason or the regular season for that matter to have your best pitcher to have your workhorse have an ERA that touches three and a half is just not the Florida Gator standard. And you know, when, when the bats are not, when when you, when you don't have nine Skyler Wallace's or nine Lauren Hager's or Kelsey Stewart's in your lineup or Amanda Lorenzo's in your lineup, you're just not going to compensate for it. So, I mean, to, to bring this all full circle, the question I asked you is, were you surprised that the Florida Gators season ended in the regional round? The answer for me is a resounding no, because this team, yeah, it had moments of you know beating Georgia, beating Auburn was a nice win. They had a game where they smacked around Louisiana, who is actually currently giving LSU a good fight in its regional final. But m- moments like that, when they're scattered throughout the course, the season are not are not good enough. They're not good enough to give you confidence in a team to advance too much farther beyond its own regional. So the answer for me is no, this, this team season ended exactly where I think most Gator fans who follow this team would have told you, yeah, that that's where it's supposed to end. I'm blindfolded. I'm told the Gator season will not end with the championship. What round is it going to end in? Probably the regional final. Yeah. The regional final. Yeah. Regional final sounds about right. So to me, it's par for the course for this team. It's disappointing. It's it's not what we're used to, but the Gator softball team does have a great recruiting class coming in. Hopefully that class will sort of inject this, this program with the energy it needs to get back to the stages it's supposed to be in. So that's softball. Now on to the rosier stickball sport, Gator baseball, which Ethan is now the SEC champ. So we got a sweep over Vanderbilt to talk about first, plus a road series win over Kentucky. Then we'll look forward to the postseason. The Vanderbilt sweep. What did you take away from that weekend series? And what does it mean to you that the Gators are SEC champs? Uh, It's the Vanderbilt sweep, which was a big, big part of the reason why the Gators are SEC champs. Because Vanderbilt, coming into that series a couple weeks ago, was um, the two games ahead of us in the standings of the crown for a very, very good conference, always in baseball, SEC, which could have 10 at 10 or 11 even teams in the tournament this year. 
it, the Vanderbilt sweep was huge because going into that, following a series loss against Texas A&M, who's a very solid team, but definitely we took a little after the sweep in Missouri the week prior, we definitely took a little hill down. So going to that Vanderbilt series, they were number five in that series. It's just we came in with confidence. We didn't we we didn't think about who we were playing. We just played baseball, flashed the offense, and then the final two games, the Gators flashed a lot of great pitching in that game. I mean, giving up only four runs to Vanderbilt in the last two games was another big reason why the first game was just dominance in pitching and hitting. And then the last two games was more pitching dominance and we just that series showed us that the Gator pitching staff can beat good teams. It depends on which one shows up, but they showed that in that series. And obviously this series they won against Kentucky, which clinched the SEC championships. And it just means to me that this Gators team is special. I mean, we've seen it from the beginning. Um, there have been they've been very consistent for a baseball team. Obviously, in baseball, you play such a long season. Um, you're going to have one or two nights where it's you're not the same. But this this has shown me in a very deep SEC team this year that the Gators have came through when it matters, especially towards the for the last two series of the season with Vanderbilt the sweep and the series went at a very good Kentucky team. It just shows me that this team has the energy. I mean, we see the Gators get pushed around all year by umpires with Brandon Neely, that four game suspension against Georgia. And he's back, and he's becoming the closer for the Gators. And um, Hurts and Waldrop, with him having to change his motion, he came through pretty good in the Kentucky series. And he was going to come through pretty well in the Vanderbilt series, but the rain delay was effective. But it just means to me that this team is special, and it's a team that the, that can very well compete for a national title. And we just have so many good freshmen, so many good piece, veteran pieces. We have it all. Um, the top of the order, the bottom of the order comes through too. Um, Luke Heyman, uh, Michael Robertson. Uh, we've seen Derek Fabian come through when he's been given time. We just we also have a solid bench. Um, so yeah, it just means to me that this team is special, and we're ready with the regionals coming up to get past our regional. And this is the team that can do it. Yeah, I mean, the Vanderbilt series was was one that I, I had definitely earmarked as one that I thought Florida would win. I was not expecting a sweep. So that, to me, was an eye-opener that Florida was able to get all three from Vanderbilt, which turned out to make all the difference because of what, what would happen the following week with Vanderbilt beating Arkansas two out of three. Florida would wind up not only – some people may not necessarily know this, but not only does Florida have – a share of the sec championship but if you want to get really technical about it th there is no sharing florida wins the tiebreaker and is the champion of the sec because i mean as you see from the seedings florida has the number one seed arkansas has number two and the reason that is is because when you have two teams that haven't played each other in the regular season the one of the higher up tiebreakers is that you take the team that both teams have played, the, the, the highest seeded common opponent in the conference, and you just compare the teams head to heads against them. Florida 3 0 against Vanderbilt, Arkansas 1 and 2. Florida wins that tiebreaker. Florida is the SEC champ by virtue of that tiebreaker. So if you really want to get technical or nitty gritty, there is no sharing. There's you know, there's just one champion that's Florida. Obviously, both teams have the same record. They're both 20 and 10. So perfectly logical and reasonable to, to call them co-champions. I get all that. I'm just I'm just being a little snarky towards some Arkansas fans. But bottom line is this Florida team showed what they were capable of against Vanderbilt. And I think we all knew the bats were going to be there. I mean, it was nice to see Derek Fabian step up. He's he's definitely had some struggles at the plate in his time in Florida, but it was nice to see him step up when his name was called against the top five opponent and just put some barrels on balls and, and really announce himself as just another weapon in that Florida lineup to me though. And this, this kind of segues into the next question, which is going to be the Kentucky series, but Jack Caglione on the mound. We, we, we call him Jack Tani. We call him, you know, the, 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 the American or the Italian Shohei Otani. Cause he's so dominant in both, uh, from from a hitting perspective and from a pitching perspective. But the truth is he hasn't really done so much to justify that from the mound. 
so far this year. He's had some flashes, but I mean, like, for example, against Tennessee, he was awful. And then in that third game in Knoxville, he was just awful. And he couldn't make it out of the first inning. And he had some other showings that were maybe not quite that that terrible, but definitely raised some questions about what he was capable of as a starting pitcher. And there was a debate among Gator baseball fans, well, who's our third pitcher going to be? Because I don't know that I trust Caglione. Against Vandy and against Kentucky, he was absolutely tremendous. He had he had what, what seemed like a, a completely newfound control of his changeup. It was just flummoxing hitters left and right. He just looked like an MLB starter because Vanderbilt and Kentucky both looked clueless against him. Uh, against Kentucky, he went six and two. No, sorry, against Kentucky, he went seven innings, shut out ball, only allowing four hits and scattered them throughout. No runs in that game allowed. And against Vandy, he goes six and two-thirds, walks one, but gives up one hit and one run. That's tremendous. Love to see that. Love to see the way he would just shut them down. And I think we've got our third starter. So, I mean, that's what I took away. And I think that's what a lot of Gator fans are taking away from this team is that we've now got three starters we can truly depend on heading into the NCAA tournament. I fully agree with that. Um, Jack Caglione has shown these past, his past two starts that he's changed his mindset. He's shown that when you have a great changeup, you can get – hitters out not just lefty on lefty which you know obviously the pitcher is going to have an advantage there but changeups work especially well against right-handed hitters because you see the drop more and it just makes it a lot harder on a lefty on righty matchup because Jack Coglin is a lefty pitcher and we've also shown we've also seen that he can pitch these big games I mean the Vanderbilt game he pitched going for going for the series win on that mound uh coming up coming up after the rain delay, he was just, I mean, he was able to find a way to pitch and win that series. And then obviously the big game against Kentucky, the final game that ju- we just played on Saturday, he was just amazing too. He didn't give up a single run, uh, only four hits. He limited his, he threw strikes. He was able to just take command the game. And I mean, especially with him in the bat, he's just a dangerous player and he's, as now that we have our third starter, watch out. The Florida Gators are going to make some noise in the postseason. And coming up to the postseason, we're very likely to get a regional. What do you think, Neil, of the postseason ahead for the Gator baseball team? I don't think there's any likely about it. Florida's got a regional host locked up. In fact, they've had a regional host spot locked up for weeks now. I think the question was whether or not they were going to host a super regional and get one of those top eight seeds Pretty sure that's locked down too now because of that series win over Kentucky. And for what it's worth, Kentucky is a solid team. I think the fact that they're ranked 19th in the country is very misleading. I think that's a team that's probably going to get a regional host spot. They're probably going to get a, between a yeah, between 10 and 16, maybe 11 and 16, depending on how Hoover goes in the SEC tournament, but that's a that's a deceptively lowly ranked team that Florida just took two out of three of on the road in Kentucky. So that was you know that that series win I think meant more than maybe some people realize, and it meant more than just you know beating a team on the road and getting a share of the SEC championship. That's one of the top three or four teams in the country according to the D1 Baseball RPI too. So that's another massive resume booster. For Florida, and I think what Florida is doing now is just bolstering its its resume for a top two or three ish seed, which will keep the the really high two seeds like we saw last year in Oklahoma, who was actually ranked ninth in the country but didn't get a host seed. They were snubbed out of one. That was a dangerous two seed that came to Gainesville last year and beat us. We're assuring ourselves that we're not going to face a team that the NCAA tournament committee deems to be between like 17th or 20th in the country from coming to Gainesville in our regional. We're going to get a much, much cushier and much softer draw in our regional than we got last year. And on that note, I just released a bracketology that I, I work on every week or every other week or so today. And just for perspective, I have Florida in a regional with North Carolina and Oklahoma, as well as, as well as Maine, North Carolina is 14 and 14 in the ACC. They're exactly 500 in the ACC. And Oklahoma is one of the final teams I have in the field of 64. So that's 
I mean, first of all, a shell of the Oklahoma team we saw a year ago, but that's just more, that's, that's going to be a far easier regional for Florida to navigate through than a year ago where they had a Liberty team that beat them and actually wound up being the first team knocked out of the regional, a, a scrappy central Michigan team, which is, I think was a, a fairly high four seed a year ago and Oklahoma, which was a top 10 team in the country in the rankings, which was snubbed out of a host spot coming to Gainesville. So Florida's regional, I think, is going to be easier because of the fact that they have so long ago locked up that top eight spot or that top 16 spot. And, and I think now have locked up a top eight spot and are going to get a more, I guess, bracketologically favorable draw. Um, so that, I think, is going to take care of itself. But the Gators still have a have, have some bad memories posting regionals the last couple of years. Obviously, we know what happened last year with Oklahoma knocking them out. Two years ago, South Alabama and South Florida, two and queued them from their regional. And I think the Gators this time around are looking at a College World Series or bust sort of sort of field of the postseason. I think a third straight elimination from its own regional would be seen as as pretty devastating given what this team has accomplished in the regular season. But just the way that that they've looked, just the eye test. Part of it. I mean, we know the stats are better. We know the record is better. We know that Cags has broken the record for home runs, and we know that you know Cags and Sprode and Hurston Waldrop give Florida a really solid rotation. But just just the eye test of sitting down and watching this team play makes you think that they're really capable of more than what we saw the last couple of years, where they were good in spots, but just very very inconsistent. So, Ethan, to you, what is it that sticks out more? about this team that makes you think they're capable of a lot more than just a regional appearance? Uh, I think this year, this team is going to come with an especially a, a chip on their shoulder in the postseason, and they play with an extra sort of energy that I haven't seen in the team's past. And I mean, a huge part of that that we didn't have last year and what could lead us deep into the postseason is player like Jack Hagelin, who's basically, yes, like you mentioned, the Shohei Otani of college baseball in terms of the way he hits and pitches now very well when it matters. And having him the way he is this year is a huge added to the team. Having some very good freshmen this year that have came through, Cade Curlin, Luke Heyman has been a very solid catcher, DH. And we have so many players that can play many different positions. And it's just... This team is just very deep and offensively. And now that we have our third starter, that will be a big difference when we do have to win at least three games in the regional last couple of years, we had some inconsistent pitching, which led, which led us starting pitching. It was the bullpen too last year and what made us get knocked out of the regional too, but it was the starting pitching this year. We have the starting pitching that's been more consistent, which is definitely huge in postseason. Pitching is a big deal because you're playing three, maybe even four games in three days. So you really need to rely on that. And that's huge. I mean, I think this year we're also definitely ready to get past our regional. And I think we are going to. We're just going to play with extra energy. And with the teams being a little bit, like you said, there's going to be not as not as the teams that we were given last year, like Oklahoma, like you mentioned, that last year, we're going to definitely – do well with the pieces we have and it's the sec tournament coming up i think we should just approach it as a as a just a play come up with a game plan uh don't overdo it too much just in my opinion just play with a extra knowing that we want more than just that we want to go deep and like you said go to the college world series and compete for a championship how do you think this team is different than last year's in that way. Well, the offense is just a, a different level, especially, especially hitting for power. The offense is just a different level. They're, they're, they're 14th in the country in terms of runs scored. They're sixth in the country in terms of slugging percentage. And they're fifth in the country with 111 home runs. Florida's offense was good the last couple of years. It wasn't this level. I mean, th this is just a different, it's a different level. Yeah. I mean, no, no other way to say it. This is, this team has elevated its, its power hitting 
And it's not even just Caglione, too. I mean, Kate Curlin's got 15 plus homers. Michael Robertson's got 10. Josh Rivera's got 14 more. Wyatt Langford's got 15. It's yeah, Caglione is is the leader of the group because he's the one making all the headlines. But Florida's got five of its nine starters with double digit home runs this year. Not many teams in college baseball can say that, and no one in college baseball can say they have someone with 28 home runs in Caglione. So it's, yeah, the headliner in Caglione, but there's also depth behind him in terms of hitting for power. And and doubles, too, not even just talking pure home runs. You're talking about extra base hits, too. Florida's, I think, 40th or so in the country. I don't know. I don't understand why the D1 baseball stats haven't haven't updated in the last couple of days, but... As of Friday afternoon, when this when this thing was last uploaded, updated at six forty two a.m., Florida was forty first in the country with doubles. So they hit alleys, they hit balls in the gaps, they hit balls over the fence, and their average is pretty good too. They hit, I think, the the forty fifth highest average in college baseball last I checked. It was yeah, it was it was forty fifth in the country with a three hundred one team batting average. So that's just a different level of excellence than they've had the last couple of years. And I think you're seeing that more in the clutch situations too. It's not just the raw numbers; it's when you have guys on second and third and one out. The Gators are delivering with you know a rocket into the gap, or even just even just a Texas leaguer over everyone's head that just falls through. They're just putting enough of their bat on the ball that it's getting the job done. So whatever the situation is, the Gators are making sure that they get the clutch hits and they're getting the sheer numbers that have them in the top 50 of pretty much every statistical category in college baseball. So even as as we kind of wrap this pod up and we, we look ahead a little bit, what do you think is going to make the difference for the Gators, not just in the regional, but in the NCAA tournament as a whole? Because we're looking at more than just a regional. We're, we're looking at a super regional and hopefully a college World Series trip. So what do you think is going to make the difference between the Gators getting eliminated and and making a real push towards that championship that we always strive for? I think it's definitely the consistency in the pitching. And if our third starter, Jack Caglione, is the Jack Kaglin we saw at the end of the season, or is the one we saw against the Tennessee series? I have no worry that he, I don't think he will be that rough that he was in that Tennessee series. I think, though, the thing is, is that we need to come out early and come out hot. And this is a very deep team on deep teams to go deep in the postseason and dangerous on both sides of the plate. But I just think we definitely need to see that bottom of the order to come through when it's not. Wyatt Langford, Wyatt Langford's not hitting an extra base hit or home run every night. We need to see the bottom of the order come through and that extra guy like a Derek Fabian, uh, somebody like him. We need to have somebody else who comes through because every single team in the NCAA tournament is going to likely try and give you a game. So we need to have that extra player that is going to come through. And especially with the bullpen too that we've seen in the in the past, we've seen it not be amazing, but it's starting to do better. We just need to see that those two, that that be good too. I mean, there's quite a bit because every single team is going to want, is going to come and play hard against us, no matter who we are and how highly seeded we're going to be. So I, I totally am not worried, but of course it's the postseason and anything could happen, but I'm confident. What about you? Well, to me, it's fairly simple, and it's we see we see the Brandon Neely that we have seen in 24 of his 25 outings and not the Brandon Neely we saw in the one outing against Georgia. Because to me, if you've got a closer that you can reliably go to in a close game to not only just get you the last three outs, Neely can get you six, seven, eight, and he's even gotten – nine outs before if you have a closer that you can rely on in the seventh inning or later to slam the door shut i think you put yourself ahead of a lot of other teams in terms of how confident you're feeling late in the game with a lead because we know florida's bullpen this year aside from neely has not been great it's gotten better it's definitely better in may than it was in february but it's still not one that i think we can really trust to hold the lead. Yes, there are good moments from Cade Fisher 
you know, Blake Purnell does some good things. I like some map, some outings that Philip Abner and Ryan Slater have given us. There's definitely some potential to, to go a, a long distance in the game and, and keep an opponent and keep an opposing offense at bay, but it's not quite that slam the door shut. You're done scoring. We're locking it down and we're winning the game from here type of, of feel that we've had with some, some pass bullpens. I mean, remember, remember the days when we had Brady Singer and Jackson Coar and Alex Fiedo in our bullpen. And we just knew that, that those guys were going to be special. I, I don't get that feel from this bullpen we have now aside from Brandon Neely who aside from that one Georgia game has been absolutely lights out for the Florida Gators. So I think if you see a situation where the Gators are in a one run game, one way or another, where Florida's down one run, go to Neely, trust him to keep the opposing, the opposing team at bay, trust that your offense can get a run or two in the last couple of innings. Or if you're up a run or two, you have Neely come in and slam the door shut and you feel good about your chances to to finish the game off and go on to the next round, the next stage in your pool, whatever. The fact that Neely only has 10 saves on the year is much more testament to the fact that the offense does not play a ton of games that are only three runs or less. I mean, just, just against Vanderbilt, he came on and he, quote unquote, saved two games. He finished them off. Florida was winning by four runs, so he doesn't get the chance for a save, but he slammed the door shut in both of those games. So to me, if Brandon Neely can continue to be the Brandon Neely that we've seen for 24 of the 25 outings this year, then I think Florida has a leg up on a lot of the teams that they're going to face. I I agree with everything you said, and we need to see, especially if we're going to be in that regional final, maybe I, I, I really hope it doesn't get to that where we have to play winner take all game seven in our regional. Uh, we're going to also need – somebody not just brandon neely but if we have to bring in an extra starter to pitch the final three outs because that situation happens a lot in postseason baseball i mean when you have that many games in that many days and you use you're going to use your bullpen more we're going to need also that extra starter who's on short days rest whether it be uh brandon sprout i think is most likely to come in and shut the door in a super regional or regional upcoming here but we're going to need him in players on short days of rest. Uh, we need to see similar starting pitching, even on pitching not very long ago. Yeah, for the most part, I think that that Sully does protect arms a bit. Sometimes maybe more than is for the good of the team. But at the same time, you can't really fault him for that because that's why he's known as the pitching guru because he doesn't throw guys' arms out. But, I mean... Like, for example, I think a year ago, it would have been nice to see Brandon Sproke come in in that in the last few innings against Oklahoma. Instead, Florida went with Ryan Slater, and he 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 blew the game, and Oklahoma wound up winning on you know, on first a, a Peyton Graham homer, and then things kind of got out of hand later on in that inning. But, I, I mean, Florida's in a spot now where they have enough potential guys to go to that you – are you yeah you're nervous but you're not automatically assuming things are going to get bad really quick because you know Slater and Purnell and Fisher and you know and Abner and you know, there, there are seven or other guys or so in the bullpen you could point to that yeah they they've done enough good things that you can say oh well he did that good thing for us so he can do it again like there's a there's a precedent of seven or eight guys in the bullpen having given Florida some good quality innings that you can feel somewhat good about your chances to keep the opposing team at bay. But I really think that Florida is going to need, having said all of that, they're going to need good starts from their, from their starters, from Spurt, Waldrop and Caglione, and then, you know, give the ball over to Brandon Neely with a two, three run lead at, at least in the seventh or eighth inning and hope he can close it out from there. Cause if Florida has to go into a bullpen war with, say, a Wake Forest in the College World Series, or even even a North Carolina or a or a West Virginia or a team like that in the regional, I don't know that I love Florida's chances. So that that's where I get a little scared. Or adding this on to your point about the starting pitching going deep enough, so we don't have to get into bullpen day. Or if Mother Nature comes in and knocks out one of our starters for a rain delay, we've seen that happen a lot in past in Gainesville regionals where there's just been long hours, long rain delays, 2017 super regional against Wake Forest. I remember waiting that one out 
and then Alex Fiedo came in and closed it that year. That was a memorable year. But and especially in pa- years past, we've just seen the rain. Hopefully, will not come and knock out one of our starters, and then us have to bring in our bullpen early enough. Even though we did see in Vanderbilt um, the series that we swept Vanderbilt, Hurts and Waldrip pitched not even one inning. He looked looked very good that that inning, but we were, we had to go in the bullpen, and they did do their job. So that's that's another thing we need to hope for is that there's not very many scenarios like the rain. Yeah, I don't know that I want to repeat that Vanderbilt scenario too many more times. It worked out that one time. Florida got the win. They got the sweep. That was great. I don't know that if the circumstances were to repeat themselves, it would play out quite that that nicely for Florida. But like you said, you know, rain in Gainesville in June is just something that happens. You got to deal with it. You got to know it's coming. I think that's actually why Sully likes to play that first game in the regional because when you're the host team, you get to choose. Do you want to play the earlier game or the later game on the opening day of the regional? And he recently has always chosen to go with the first game so that he doesn't get caught with a long rain delay and has to you know worry and wonder about what's going to happen with his pitching rotation in the next couple of days because it's all thrown out of whack. No, just get the first game out of the way, win it, be done, and then just move on. But you know what? <laughs> We're gonna we're gonna find out. We're gonna get answers to all this real soon. We're gonna get to see who the Gators face in their regional. We're gonna see the game time. That's all gonna come out very soon. We're talking about the Gator baseball team now on this podcast about about almost a week exactly to the day to the minute of when the selection show is gonna happen, and we're gonna have the draw and the times and all that be revealed to us. So. You know, Ethan, we, we wait for the postseason for months on end with Gator baseball, and it's almost upon us. And I have to say, I feel better about this team than I felt about any Gator team since you know, since 2018, the last time we, we made it to Omaha. So, um, yeah, I mean, hope hope the rain holds up. Hope the officials don't screw us over. Uh, we've already seen the NCAA screw Florida over in two major ways this year. Uh, first with, with forcing Hurston Waldrop to change his pitching motion after somehow being just fine and dandy with his motion for not just his first couple of seasons at Southern Miss, but then plus 11 weeks, 11 starts of his at Florida this year. Several of those games were on national TV. Four of them had NCAA brass in attendance. They could have said something then. They didn't. Only after 11 games in his third season as a starter did the NCAA decide something was wrong with it. So hopefully there's no more shenanigans coming from the NCAA office. But, you know, we, we, we can't predict that. We can't anticipate that. We can only just go into the game knowing that, you know, we control certain things and just control what we can control, and that's all we can do. So that's all for this episode of the In All Kinds of Weather Forecast. If you enjoyed this episode, please give us a nice review and a five-star rating on our podcast. Definitely appreciate that. Ethan, uh, get insight from you as always on the Gators stickball sports. Enjoyed having you as an intern this year and looking forward to talking a little bit more Gator stickball on the road because this Gator baseball team is far from done. Thank you. I'm very excited for the Gator baseball postseason and thank you for having me very much. You got it, man. See y'all soon. Go Gators. Gators. <laughs>